Hi everybody, I'm Chris Howard and welcome to Top of Mind. Today's session really is top of mind and it's about AGI or artificial general intelligence. What I want to do is kind of talk a little bit about Gartner's position on it, but also why we as humans tend to see other things as humans and why that might not be useful and kind of chart out a different future for how we might think about computers and machines as they evolve. So I was having a recent conversation with a client and they asked, what is Gartner's position on artificial general intelligence or AGI? And so I thought about it and I thought, what well, do we have a position on AGI? And to be honest, there are lots of positions on AGI within Gartner. People have very sophisticated views on this, sometimes competing views and so on, which is what makes it hard. But let's maybe talk a little bit about where the term comes from. It comes from the very early days of artificial intelligence research and some of the early implementations of the 1950s, 1960s where part of the, the goal was to see if we could create machines or computers that could replicate what humans did. And with the idea being that there'd be some point in the future where a computer can do any task that a human can do. And so in the intervening years, of course, what's happened is that computers have become really smart and are actually much better at doing some things that humans are. And so part of, of machine evolution has gone beyond what humans are capable of. But is that really AGI? AGI has another component to it, which is, can the machine think? Is it sentient? Can it solve problems it's never seen before in ways that humans can? Can it feel about things? This is where, of course, it gets greater. Since the introduction of generative AI technologies that we've become familiar with, it appears that these machines think, they respond, they're empathetic, and so on. But I want to remind you that what they really are are prediction machines. They predict the orders of words, which can be contextual and sort of responsive, but it still doesn't necessarily mean that the machine understands what it's saying or actually has empathy or feels a certain way. So it may be able to identify, say, the picture of a cat and recognize it as a cat in multiple different ways, but it can have a relationship with a cat. Can it feel something about that cat or so on? That's less sure. But it does raise an interesting question, is why do we as humans tend to want to see inanimate things as humans? As I've been reading up on this a, a fair amount in the last several weeks and finding some interesting points of view, one that I find quite striking is that the desire or the tendency to cast human attributes onto something is actually a survival mechanism that comes from human evolution. So if you encountered something unusual, you thought of, okay, this is the most dangerous thing I can encounter, and the most dangerous thing you could encounter was another human. So you cast human attributes onto it as a, as a means of, of survival. So it's very, very primal. But what I've seen happen, of course, is that we tend to cast human attributes onto things that we don't quite understand or are mysterious. So, for example, mythology is an example of us casting human characteristics onto the unknown. Is it something that we do as a way to try to understand them? And so it makes sense then as our computers get more complicated and machines and information become more complicated, we use an anthropomorphizing point of view in order to understand them more effectively. But I think that's actually a limitation. One of the limitations that comes along with thinking of machines as humans or replicating human intelligence is that it blinds us from the other types of intelligence that are out there. We've talked about this on, on the series before, but think about things around us that have an intelligence that isn't human intelligence, like a grove of, of aspen trees that communicates through chemical signals in the root systems, or of ants that communicate using pheromones to find food. So very sort of specific, domain-specific types of intelligence for, again, survival purposes. Bacteria, viruses act this way, and so on and so on. And so by only thinking of human intelligence as a goal for machines, we actually create a limitation to say, maybe this is the kind of, of intelligence that is going to provide the most value. And I think that's a false statement. What I see in really intelligent systems is systems working together. And so like the ants, the ants finding food, they use pheromones to signal, bacteria using chemicals to signal these types of things for very specific purposes. So if we built machinery that was very domain specific to solve a certain class of problem and then connected those with other systems that were solving related types of problems, then we get to a much more sophisticated kind of distributed intelligence environment. 
then to anthropomorphize myself, that's actually the way a lot of systems in the body work. The autonomic systems, kind of, if you don't think about them, they work on their own, they interact with one another, and there's sort of a level of control creating that integration. I think it's that biological model of connected intelligence that actually will bring us to a different kind of goal. Now, on the other hand, we've been creating computers using biological metaphors. So the whole idea of a of a deep neural net or unsupervised learning, you're just using tons of data and letting the machine kind of figure out the interactions and relationships between that data. That's very much modeled on how we believe the brain works. Now, if that's true, the way the brain optimizes, if you follow, say, psychologists like Piaget and others that study early childhood psychology, this is about patterns and, and repeatable patterns. And so machines are doing some of that, where they're actually looking for patterns and then using those recognition of patterns to optimize the output that they create. So there is some of like Piaget type thing going on. What's different though, from human evolution and machine evolution, is human evolution is very much based on risk and reward. So avoiding things that will harm us or seeking things that are good for us. That's hard to translate into how a machine might act. So, what is it that a machine values? Uh, what's a corrective action you could take on a machine short of unplugging it? And so those types of metaphors don't actually transfer very well over to the evolution of machines. My contention here is this, that the idea of a vanishing point where you could say, can we create machines that appear to function like humans is an interesting design point to say, let's get as close to that as we can. But we're at a point where machine capabilities now are so sophisticated that we actually need to let that branch on its own and actually let machines evolve in ways that are that, that are natural for machines, if that's the way you can say it, to let them really become expert systems in specific things and then learn how to leverage those in this larger set of intelligence. This brings me to the final point, which is this relationship between humans and machines. There's some philosophers that talk about this concept of mutuality. So if you've ever had the experience where you are, you know, with a, a horse or a large animal or something like that, or even a dog, a lot of us have dogs. Sometimes you have the sense that, you know, there's this other being that's with you and you feel sort of a mutual experience. Maybe you're working on something together. You know, I, you know, I have Australian shepherds. Maybe I've taught them to do something and they go do it. There's a sense of interaction there. The same thing is happening with machines and the use of machines to augment human experience. What needs to happen for co-evolution to take place is for machines and humans to work together in the pursuit of difficult problems. And what will happen as those problems get solved is that both sides of that equation really will learn to trust each other, human trusting machine, and the machine actually starting to understand where human input is going to cause a better output as well. So to summarize, artificial general intelligence, it's a hard thing to have a position on. It's a philosophical point of view that actually has driven the evolution of machine intelligence. There are lots of different types of intelligence and maybe our tendency to cast human characteristics onto technology limits us from what it could actually do. Let's let machines evolve and create an intelligence that interacts with humans in ways that solve the hardest problems that we face. And then it becomes a mutual experience. Now, all of this sounds like really, you know, sort of maybe sophisticated and, you know, abstract, but it really isn't. We interact with these types of technologies every day. And what Gartner is doing is sort of studying that evolution in terms of human computer interaction, actual ev evolution and innovation within the deep infrastructure of chip making, for example ambient environments where you're interacting with data in lots of deep and interesting ways and studying all of that for the purpose of understanding how you harness that power and use it to build businesses, to build societies, to interact with citizens, with patients, with students, and so on. And you're going to see this at our conferences coming up. There are CIO forums that take place through the spring. Uh, we have upcoming security and, C and finance practice uh, events. We have you know, a, a number of events that are happening through the summer of 24 and into the beginning of the fall. And so you're going to see this content that I'm talking about brought, into, brought to life in, in multiple different ways. Given that this is such a complex issue and an interesting issue, 
I really want to know what you're thinking, feeling, what you're working on. So please add that into the comments and open up a conversation about the possibilities here. Uh, just I've mentioned a couple of things I've been reading. might be useful for you to know what they are. Highly recommend it. It's a book by George Dyson called Darwin Among the Machines, which talks about machine evolution and possible futures there. And a much more recent book by Megan O'Geeblin, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correct, Megan O'Geeblin, called God, Human, Animal, Machine. And it's teasing through these relationships that I'm talking about. Of why do we tend to create things in our image as a means of understanding them? And how does that hold us back and create biases instead of opportunity? I'm Chris Howard. Thanks for joining me on Top of Mind and we'll see you next time.